Well, hello. Our guest today is a retired neuropsychologist with 40 years of experience. 40 years of working with humans, listening to them and learning from them. I strongly believe that one of the most important skills you can ever acquire and hone is the ability to understand why people do what they do. This man has been walking that path for most of his life. Here's my friend, Dr. James Johnson. I never quite know what's going to get included. Some of that may, some of it may not. It may start right now. I'm not really sure. But I know you said just a second ago that you wanted to have kind of like a disclaimer. Yep. So if you want to go for that. All right. Um, introduce myself or? Well, no, no, no. I mean, you don't have to do that if you don't want to. Um, did you want to say anything about the content of the, the conversation preemptively or? Um, basically what I need to say is that, uh, I'm here for fun. Okay. Um, I am transitioning, um, nothing that I talk about will have anything to do with the practice of psychology. I'm putting that in the rear view mirror. And so don't think of me as a licensed psychologist. Think of me as a guy with 40 years of experience practicing psychology, who's in the process of retiring to become essentially a spiritual coach. Okay. After 40 years of learning the human mind and asking questions, that's the direction that you've been led, yeah? Yep. Yeah? What, what, did, what did 40 years of, forgive me if I'm wrong, I, I view you as sitting in a room with a patient and a notepad and asking them questions and figuring out their issues, correct? That's some of what I do. Okay. Well, well, so, so go ahead and just so kind of- 60% of what I have done over the, the past 40 years is evaluation. So people come in, they have a had a brain trauma or uh, maybe their uh, counselor wants to know what their actual diagnosis is. Um, maybe their physician wants to know how to treat them better. Uh, get to referrals from attorneys if there's been a, an auto accident and they need to know what the person's abilities are. And so there's a process of sitting with them. You evaluate the, the situation and then you use psychological tests to tell what's going on in the brain. So you're, you're referred people from other situations. Yes. It's not like people search you out independently. Uh, rarely. So okay. maybe one in 10 people, maybe they heard somebody else that saw me and they'll come and go, oh, this guy's amazing. So you got to go see him. Okay. So. Cool. And you said it's it's been exactly 40 years or plus 40? It'll be uh, 40 in October. Wow. That's... It's impressive to stick with the same thing for that long. Yep. People don't really do that anymore. Uh, not to discredit you or say anything either way. It's just like to do anything for 40 years is like serious dedication. Yeah, I've been married for 48 years. <laughs> well, there you go. There's another one. You're a solid guy. Yeah, really loyal. Yeah, well, there you go. So we, before we started, you were saying that uh, you've been in Portland uh, your entire career. Yep. And we were talking about how much things had changed. Yes. So what, if you could take us back in time to 1971, when so you started- 1979. 79, sorry. Yeah. When you started in 79, what, I, I mean, I'm sure it would take forever to explain all the differences, but what were the main differences then compared to now? Um, well, you know, if I take myself back um, it seems like the pace of life was a little bit slower. Um, interestingly enough, in my neighborhood, when I moved in in the late 70s, there was a lot of drugs uh, being trafficked in the park. And it took them two or three years to get it cleaned up. Now the park is quiet and no homeless people. And the Mount Tabor is a really nice neighborhood. Lots of my neighbors have lived there as long as I have. Okay. But, but what what is different in terms of practicing your profession? Like I'm sure there have been monumental uh, discoveries and changes in the act of treating somebody in 40 years, right? Yeah. So at the time I came out of my doctorate program, um, there was a lot of experimental stuff that was going on. Um, it was much more relaxed and open. Uh, today, it's uh, pretty marshaled. There's, uh, you know, you're supposed to be using only evidence-based treatment. Um, and 
there's a, you know, we've gotten really quite politically correct. Okay. It used to be it was pretty comfortable, whatever it is that you did interacting with the patient, as long as you're, you know, prudent, not screwing the patient, mm -hmm. um, it's going to be okay. And today it's, you know, um, if a patient complains at all, the board's very likely to find on the patient's side, no matter what the complaint is. So that greatly influences the way that you speak with people because you're worried that they're going to tell on you. Yeah, if you if you take an ethics class, we had a couple of attorneys here, uh, Cooney and Madigan, who specialize in in doing ethics presentation. They like to scare the crap out of you. <laughs> so when you're done with an ethics presentation, you know all the ways that you are going to get screwed. And so you know if you're quick on your feet, you've got tons of paperwork to second guess the situation and think about if they said this or if they said that. You know that uh, you've covered the bases. So. Mm -hmm. So what is the main concern when you're dealing with somebody that they're going to accuse you of sexual assault or something like what? I mean, if you're sitting with somebody and you're talking with them and you, for example, let's say you deduce from the situation that they had childhood trauma. Are you concerned that if you give them an honest opinion that they're going to be like upset with you? Well, you know, when we deal with trauma, the the thing that we're most aware of is that uh, the the patient probably won't know what will happen if they get triggered. And so you have to tell them ahead of time, hey, this is trauma. And we could be talking about anything, even a mundane thing, and you might get triggered. And so you just need to know when that happens, you, just, you say stop. And we look at the triggering because it may feel like I attacked you, might feel like it's not safe. Um, and when that happens, um, I need to know and we need to plan ahead of time that, uh, you know, we can stop and deal with when you don't feel safe. But your goal is to listen to people and help them. Yes. You can't help it if you trigger them. I don't see how I could function without triggering people. I'm triggering people all the time. <laughs> and I'm more likely to trigger uh, people than the average psychologist because I'm hot. Okay. I have a lot of emotion, a lot of intensity, and I react really quickly. Okay. So that can scare the shit out of somebody. Has that developed over time or has it always been that way? Um, I'd say that, you know, I'm faster than I ever was before. I'm more passionate. I'm more committed to the well-being of the human being sitting in front of me. And I'm I'm better at running around in the back of their mind to find the resources that they haven't discovered. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if, if you're used to being with somebody who grooms you, well, I look like a sociopath. <laughs> so, well, that's fun. Yeah. But I'm, I'm searching around in your mind for how your resources show up and then tagging them so that you can see them. So you know that they're there because most of the time when you work with trauma, people have spent most of their life dodging their trauma, trying to look normal and not realizing how resilient they are. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a lot of stuff that gets buried, too, that people don't even know is there. And I imagine you bring that out if you start talking about something. It's, it's certainly possible. It's not my favorite thing to do. Yeah. And normally what I will do in sort of anticipation is to say, okay, um, when stuff comes up, you do not have to tell me about it. You don't have to go tell me the story of how that happened. If that seems to be helpful for you, then let's do it. Mm -hmm. But if it's not, let's just let it be and just realize that it's there. You don't have to expose yourself in front of me. I don't believe that trauma is resolved by re-experiencing. I think that trauma resolves because you understand how the nervous system works. And the nervous system is just healthy and trying to take care of you. So what, what do you do if somebody comes in with significant childhood abuse or um, neglect, like how, how do you help them get to a spot where they can be better? Well, the better spot begins with me. We okay. don't have to even deal with the trauma. Are you safe with me? Do you notice that I look inside of you, see you, and I don't 
judge. I'm not moved. I care about you. Can I hold that space so you can feel that? Because if you can feel that, now we can explore a little bit and notice when we lose that sense of connection. That's, mm -hmm. you know, that way we can go anywhere. So based on trust, they got to trust you. Yeah, and, yeah. It, and it's a trust, not head trust. It's physical trust because your, your, your autonomic service, uh, system is physical. Okay. It's in the nervous system. It's preverbal. So if you can't establish a preverbal trust, so I look at your eyes, and then I notice the energy in your head. Then I feel it down into your body. Then I can feel your hips and your legs and your feet. I can tell how grounded you are. Mm -hmm. And as I'm speaking to you, my voice is hypnotic. You can feel in the voice that your mind is already beginning to do something just a little different. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, you must be an expert at reading body language, right? Yep, yep. Yeah. It's a very important skill yeah. uh it's cool reading faces is a very important skill and i mean i've read books and um that were based on studies that have suggested based on science based on fact that uh women are better at reading faces uh based on thousands of years of evolution and taking care of babies uh, women are just better at reading faces most of the time and understanding the nuance of your eyebrow raising and your eye closing a little bit. And just, and that's typically why guys don't know when people are mad or upset unless they're angry, right? That's what guys are best at. Yeah, because yeah. that's how they react. And yeah. also uh, the act of crying. That's why women are more likely to cry, correct? To gain a response from a man who can't usually understand what he's seeing. Well, I'd say that women are closer to the tears. They don't see any particular reason to filter them. Yeah. And men are that taught too. that filtering them is a good idea. For sure. For sure. Let's keep it tough. Yeah. Yeah. There's lots of things uh, in that in that realm. But so for 40 years, you've been hanging out with people. And because they are not coming to you of their own accord, they're being sent to you, you must have dealt with a lot of resistance. So um, probably a third of the people who come to me come because they already know it's going to be a good ride. Hmm. So either the people sending them are saying, look, this guy is amazing. You're going to love him. Uh, so I don't, um, there's a basic philosophy around resistance. If you're having it, you're creating it. Okay. So you don't have good enough rapport with somebody, then you get resistance. Mm -hmm. So I like people to push back. Okay. I go, congratulations, you're here. You're a real human being. Mm -hmm. You must have an ego in there. Mm -hmm. And it's beautiful. Very cool. Very cool. And so when you're working with all these people, how often do you reach a point where you decide... You're good. We're done. I mean, is it usually you determining that? Or do people usually say, I don't need you anymore? Like, how does it sever? So with evaluations, you're, you're doing it in a three-session thing. They come for an intake, they do the testing, and then I do a teaching session. At the end of the teaching session, you're done. So it may be that they, you know, need some hand-holding after that. But I, I finish about two-thirds of my people. Um, for, for therapy stuff, whatever therapy is, um, people decide when they're done, and I'll often start telling them I'm ready for them to be done fairly early on in the process. Um, these days, I get so much accomplished in the first couple of interchanges with a human being that their life is transformed. Mm -hmm. And so I'm happy to have them be done after one session. Yeah. Okay. Because these these situations where you're you're interacting with these people and helping them out, you are. I mean, they're looking f they're looking to you for guidance, and they are trusting that you have answers. And do you do you ever experience a situation where you feel like you don't have the answer? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're. There are, uh, you know, I, I have people that come to me that are, their, their pathology is stuck. 
And so I have to figure out how to take care of the human being who has the pathology so that it isn't the focus of their life. I don't, I don't like that. That's really painful. Mm -hmm. And what, in, in your experience, what is the greatest single issue? What, what is, if you could fix everything, what would, what would need to happen? I don't know. You don't know? <laughs> no. I mean, the more you do this, the less you know. <laughs> wow. I, I'm, I'm not here to know anything. I'm here to just love people and love the shit out of them. Yeah. But <laughs> it seems like there's got to be, I mean, everybody has issues and some are greater than others. And there are uh, personality disorders, which we, we, we will get into at some point, where you just... You disconnect and you can't. So, so, so let's talk about the difference between uh, axis one and axis two. So axis one, these are all your run of the mill neurotic things and they're all considered to be treatable. Axis two are your personality disorders. These are uh, things that are called uh, egocentonic. That means I'm identified with my pathology. Mm -hmm. So I'm not that excited about changing it. I'm probably there because somebody else thinks I ought to be there. So that's a different kind of a character. Well, yeah. I mean, how many access to patients have you had? Mm, I don't know. Maybe a thousand. Thousand? Because you said 10,000 total patients yeah. over 40 years. Yeah. Okay. So the majority of them are people that you could help and potentially change. But those other thousand that are access to, you're saying they're so deep in the disorder that they're incapable of change? Nah. No? No. <laughs> so let's take borderline personality, which is probably, you know, we have a couple of diagnoses that are just shitty. Okay. Uh, bipolar disorder. I mean, who the hell knows what they're doing? You, you really have a hard time sorting that out because okay. it's usually just a bunch of stuff together. Um, borderline personality is probably the worst access to diagnosis because um, 99.9% .9 of the people who get the diagnosis actually had trauma. They actually had a, um, a, a reaction attachment issue when they were growing up. And so they're called borderline, but if you go after the trauma, you can help them. If they're ready to deal with the trauma, if they're not so overly identified with, uh, you know, being dependent and helpless and, you know, being histrionic and... Well, yeah, when I... when. I started talking to you and we were discussing what we were going to talk about. The reason I brought that up is because as far as I know, that's one of the only disorders you can't just help somebody with unless they actually acknowledge they have it, right? I don't think so. No? I think, you know, <laughs> you're supposed to have people's permission in order to treat them, but I use a lot of hypnosis. Okay. And hypnosis goes through your defense system and asks, do you want to be a healthy human being? Mm -hmm. And it's rare to get a no. Yeah, but if people don't know, like it's the, it's the thing that people say all the time about being crazy. How do you know you're crazy? If you don't, <laughs> if you just experience, like maybe I'm a psycho right now and I don't know. Hmm. How would you convince me that I'm a psycho? I wouldn't. <laughs> But you know what I mean? Like, if you think that your experience is real, how is somebody going to tell you that it just wreck your entire so, life? So do you know somebody that's not delusional? I don't. I know. I think every single person has some sort of issue. It's not an issue. It's just a matter of that reality is constructed. It doesn't show up. It's not out there. It's between your ears. Yeah. And... Isn't this fun? <laughs> the, the human mind is a crazy place. And I've known a lot of people and I've talked with a lot of people. I have children. I've had girlfriends. I've had a wife. I've had friends. I have parents. Um, every single person that you interact with, there's something going on up here that you don't understand. And that's all life is. It's a constant battle to be like, why did he say that that way? Why did he text me? 
without a period? Why is there an exclamation mark there? What did he mean by, I don't want to see you tomorrow? Like, there's so many ways to interpret everything. Seems like a lot of work. It's so much work. Just like having a conversation with your boss. You're like, are they, are they mad at me? Am I going to get fired tomorrow? Like, So that's all mind chatter. Yeah, but it's it's intense. And if you, if you dwell on it too much, like it will make you crazy. Well, it's because none of it needs to be believed. It's arbitrary and you made it up. So it's within you being self-conscious about your interactions with people. Yeah, it's it's it, yeah, self-conscious is really a good good term. Huh. And it's self-conscious tends to be evaluative. In other words, you're judging. Mhm. Mm this is okay, that's not okay, that looks right, that looks wrong. That's a waste of time. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, the, the thing I always try to think about is the only person that really cares about me is me. I'm the one that's thinking about me more than anyone else. No doubt. Right? <laughs> when you're worried, oh, maybe I have something on my face. Oh, do my, do my shoes look cool right now? Like, I'm the one that's worried about that. You don't care. <laughs> you're thinking about your shoes. Right? And, and if I'm looking at you and watching what you're doing, that trivial bullshit isn't that interesting to yeah. me. Yeah. Because it's like, oh, that's, you know, squirrel cage stuff. Uh-huh. Yeah, but we get trapped in these patterns of thinking about that stuff. And... Not everyone. No? Nope. How do I be this other person that doesn't think about this stuff? <laughs> shut up. <laughs> I mean, just shut the fuck up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Because if your head is busy, stop it. Then you notice your addiction. Okay. You're addicted to being you in a particular way, but you're going to be here if you stop thinking. Your little body will be right there, a tender little sweet thing that it is. Mm -hmm. It's a gorgeous thing, mm -hmm. and it doesn't need you to think in order to be here. You don't need somebody's judgment about you in order to be here. That's just a silly little game that heads like to play. Mm -hmm. And they do that to keep us small because we're all at a cultural level in our cultural thought processes. We're all trying to be just a little smaller than we actually are. I thought we're trying to be bigger than we are. That's, that's ego stuff. And that particular bigger will always get you in trouble. Yeah, when you do stuff strictly for the gain of your persona, I guess. Well, it's an immature bigger. Uh -huh. So it's a little kid's bigger. You know, if I have more of this, if I do more of that, if I'm smarter, taller, more beautiful, mm -hmm. more athletic, that's a comparative process. But your natural bigger is divine. That is God coming through you. Yeah, but it's hard to recognize that stuff. Well, that's what we're talking for. Well, and the, the, the thing that I get caught up with is if you don't care and you don't try, then how do you get better? You can't, like, I cannot be satisfied with me right now. I can't. I can appreciate who I am, but if I'm just like, cool, I'm just going to do this, I'm never going to grow. Like, I should always be trying to do something better, right? So, <clears throat> we use language in ways that have built-in limitations, and you watch the way you use your language. If it's got comparisons built into it, it's smaller than you could be. If you go... Um, I wonder how much I don't know about myself and how much I could discover by relaxing, being open, being conscious, being gracious, being compassionate. This will actually work with anybody you know, and it will open the relationship and expand it. And so is this what you try to teach people when you're working with them? So um, teaching, it, it, it's sort of an arrogant business. So when I'm sitting with you, I, my heart's open, mm -hmm. and I'm watching to see how much you can tolerate, how much you can listen, how deeply you listen, how softly you listen. The mm -hmm. more soft your listening is, the more your, your body begins to relax and open and go, okay, I'm willing to find out about God in me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's important. Um, you can't change unless you want to change. Maybe. I don't know. If, if, a, you're if a bus hits you, 
<laughs> and you get a brain trauma, I promise you, you'll change. If you lose a leg, you'll change. If the wife walks out the door, you'll change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, shit's happening all the time. You don't have any choice. Mm -hmm. So you don't know how much you've concocted to keep yourself the same. But it is the business of mine to, to develop a thermostat and tell you when you moved out of it. And so that's got to be pretty rewarding, right? If you're starting at a base level with someone and you get to see them grow and change. Yep. Yeah, it's the gratitude they must feel for you is like pretty intense, right? It's cool. Yeah? Yeah, and then and it goes straight through me. I'm transparent when it comes to gratitude. Yeah. I love it, but it's good for you to tell me. Yeah. Yeah, I get that. It's it's a it's a unique profession and there are a lot of people who who go to the coal mine and go to Starbucks and go to Target for their you know they just have like this thing that they have to do every day and you get to go do something where you help people and you get to see progress and so that's got to be like we we're talking about super rewarding did you do you ever wake up and you're like, oh, my God, this is what I got to do today? No, fuck no. Never? <laughs> no, my goodness, no. Even I, when you know it's going to be a difficult person? Um, I just love my difficult people because I have to grow. This is all about me growing enough so you can feel loved. I'm on the spot every day. If I'm not getting better every day as a human being, this is a fucking waste of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean – it has to change you each day too, right? Is that what yeah, you're saying? Yeah, I'm not the same person I was 40 years ago. I'm, uh -huh. I'm a, you know, I'm honest, I'm open. I, I'm, I can't do political correctness. I just can't do uh -huh. it. And I, I can sit with you and, and watch you do really, really stupid things and think, I wonder why the organism is attempting to do this. How is it trying to adapt to a situation? Because you are first an organism, and that organism is perfect. It can't make mistakes. Your head will tell you you can make mistakes, but I promise you that's not helpful. You don't think we can make mistakes? Your head will tell you that you can make mistakes. So you got a mistake evaluator in there. Uh -huh. I'm just not convinced that it's useful. Huh. So you already did it. Why do we have to call it a mistake? Okay. Wasn't it the best that you could do at the time? Or do we have to beat the shit out of you? Well, then maybe there's an argument that you need to screw up. That's how you learn to not do it again. Well, you need to do something because you're an, an organism of adaptation and you, you interact with the environment and you're constantly learning. So what's the, what's the biggest issue then? Is it, is it shame? Is it guilt? What, what, what primary, if you could, if you could take it down to one thing, I know that's impossible, but if you could like condense it to something, what is the main thing that people are generally upset with? Safety. Safety. They don't feel safe. So are you going to be upset? It's only in the neurology it's a safety issue. The neurology has a fight system, a flight system, and a freeze system. Those systems are all designed to keep you from getting killed. That's all they were designed to do. And they're, they're lights that come on like your engine light that says, please check to see if there's a predator in the room. If you're angry, you're, the system is saying, this is something we can kick their ass. Mm -hmm. If you're anxious, this is something we can get away from. We can run hard enough to get away from this. If you're immobilized, depressed, dissociated, you know, just feel like shit, no energy, that's a really big bear. Yeah. So it's, it's safety. It's how you feel in your predicament with, with the people you're surrounded by, whether or not you're safe, will dictate kind of which direction you go. Yep. Yeah. And, and you are activated hundreds and hundreds of times by that system all day long. Mm -hmm. Did you get upset? You can't get upset without that system being activated. Yeah. I'm, I, think I'm, I think I'm a lot better at, at dealing with stuff. Um, than I ever was. I, th I feel like I get better at it. But I mean, even today, there were 10 different things that happened where I was fucking fired up. And I'm like, why? Why? 
can you chill out? Why are you upset about that? So that's a, a mind body chatter. Yeah. So what I would like to do is to say, okay, if your alarm system went off, in other words, you got upset about something and you notice it, by the time you notice it, it's already in a story. The story isn't accurate. It can't be accurate because the system is non-cognitive. It reacted to something. Maybe it was the tone of somebody's voice. Maybe it was how fast they moved in and out of your territory. There are just physiologic things that set that stuff off. Bam, you're in story. Now you're struggling with the story, only it's neurology. Neurology didn't make a mistake. Well, there's just certain people that enter my mind that I don't want to give space to. And I'm like, why? <laughs> why can't you stop thinking about that? It's well, so frustrating. So, so go to your feelings first. So it's first off perception. So you can go and go, fuck the story. Let's just look at how I feel when they move in and out of my territory. Mm -hmm. And you'll be able to go, oh, this is a person who pushes when they move in. Mm -hmm. And I hate the pushing. And so if you feel it as, at a physiologic level, you can go, oh, they're pushing. I'm not going to die. Because mm -hmm. the system is designed to tell you. Check to see if we're going to die. And you don't think, you don't go, good job. Thank you for asking me that question. Let me check and see if this human being is going to kill me. And if it's not, you don't need to be upset. And you think this goes back to our roots in evolution? Yeah. Yeah? Yep. Directly related to getting chased by tigers and trying to hide in... Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. so the, the oldest system, which is uh, the uh, uh, dorsal vagal system, which is in the belly. This is, this is the fight or flight. This is before fight or flight. This mm -hmm. is when you play dead. Mm -hmm. So reptiles play dead. They evacuate their bowels. They stop breathing. Their mind slows down. That's the way you feel when you're depressed. Mm -hmm. That's a natural, normal, healthy, not pathology. But we're going to make it pathology because that's the way we do shit. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of distractions now. And I wonder sometimes if it has become more difficult. What, what, do you think there are more depressed, uh, mind-diseased people now than there ever were? Do you think that the nature of where we're at with the internet and fucking Instagram and all these different things that distract us, do you think that we are more affected by our environment than we were 200 years ago? Do you think life was easier then? It's a hell of a question. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so at the fuck level, <laughs> we're in chaos. We've got COVID. Politics is horseshit. War, you know, it's like we're not, we've not been able to make the world a better place by domination. And yet, we just seem to stop being superior to somebody. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of that going on. And the less you can not distract yourself from it, the more it's in your face every day, the more likely you're going to be depressed because it's going to feel like there's a bear in the living room. Yeah, so <clears throat> has it become harder? It feels like it, either we figured it out and people have always been depressed and crazy or we are creating depressed, crazy people? Well, at a cultural level, we're not very sophisticated. So our culture isn't going to help us, and the culture is what's going to set the standard for how you do things. If you wake up and you go, I'm not culture, and you can blow up the fucking world, and I don't need to be upset. There's no bear in the room. Mm -hmm. I don't need to be upset. I'm not upset about COVID. You know, I, I'm sad that, you know, we've got Putin over there blowing the shit out of people. Mm -hmm. But it's not upsetting to me. If they drop a bomb on me, you know, I'm toast. So? That's kind of where I'm at, too. I think a lot of people are very afraid of everything. And I'm like, this is what we got right now. Yeah. I could, I could die tomorrow, so I'm going to enjoy hanging out with you. Like, why, why waste all this precious time being worried about some thing that may happen? Like, just enjoy what we're doing and 
stop worrying about everything. So you can do that if your nervous system is regulated. You can't do it if you're lost in story. If you look at the news and you go, that must be true. It's like, it's just a representation that leaves out most of the information. Mm -hmm. Everything you do with your mind leaves out most of the information. Well, you could never know everything and you could never know the, the real truth. There are so many people and so many, <coughs> excuse me, so many institutions and uh, rich people fighting against, they, they don't want us to know what's really going on. They, we ha they have to... So this conspiracy land? Well, <laughs> there has to be a concerted effort to keep regular people in this zone. Because if there's no way you could ever know what's really going on, people would freak out. I would freak out. Depends on how well your nervous system works. If there's not a bear in the room, there's not a bear in the room. Well, I just, I don't think it's worth being concerned about it. I know it's there and I know there's stuff happening and I can't understand, but like, we're only here for maybe 80, 90, 100 years. Like, why are you going to waste all that time? The older you get, and I never believed anybody that said it until I started getting into my 30s. The older you get, a week will go by. I'm sitting here talking to you right now. I'm going to feel like 10 minutes go by and it's going to be a week from now. I'll be like, how did that happen already? Mm -hmm. It just goes by quicker. And instead of enjoying what you're doing, people just get upset about everything. It's so wasteful. It's such a waste of time. So it's useful for your own head to see how beautiful people are mm -hmm. and what looks like a waste is only a waste from a particular perspective. We are children. Everything we do is a game. All of your relationships are games and you can pull back and look at the little rules that run them. And they're very, very childlike. If you're awake, whatever the person does is perfect. Because you're not running a, a con on them. You're not trying to have them fit into some rule. You're not saying you should do that or you shouldn't do that. You're just noticing what they do. And you might be curious and go, wow, that, I wouldn't, I didn't see that coming. Do you think that people reach a point in their life where they, they just stay that same person? Maybe. Um, so lots of people that I know like to lament the state of the world. I don't really care to haul that around with me. I'm just obnoxiously positive. <laughs> That's a good thing. It's like, well, I, I don't care what people's limitations are. I, I'm not wearing them. And if you bring me your limitations, I will see through them. But do you ever do you ever hang out with somebody or talk to somebody or you're in a session with somebody and you just view them as like a 10-year-old? Yeah. Two-year-old. Better. Yeah? Yeah. Because people get trapped in that scenario sometimes. I never think of it as trapped. No. That costs me too much. Okay, so what what are they doing? If they're if they have reverted to their ten year old, why are they doing that? So reversion is a comparison. Okay. I don't do that. Okay. So if you show up as a ten year old, congratulations. That's okay. where we're gonna meet. Okay. I'm gonna love you as a ten year old. And we're gonna think like ten year olds together. And I'm gonna be curious to see what you're able to do. In addition to being a 10-year-old, or do we need to sit and absolutely ex accept this is where you're at and this is where the beauty in your life is? Can we celebrate life from this particular place? Do I have to fix you? <laughs> it's like, fuck me. <laughs> but you realize when that happens, right? You realize when somebody's talking to you that they are not 47 years old or something, right? Yeah, nobody stays your stated age. You just don't. I watch you moving around. Oops. Sorry. <laughs> I watch you move around. I feel you move around. You know, what, what happens to you at a neurologic level over time when you do what I do is you develop mirror neurons. 
and mine are very well developed. I feel little subtle things in you that shift that you would never notice. I think that goes with your 40 years of experience. Yep. I mean, if you if you worked at a shoe factory and you made shoes for 40 years, you'd be pretty awesome at making shoes. I would hope so. <laughs> <laughs> but so, I mean, I thought about this earlier. So that means like, there must not be a lot of confidence in a 26-year-old psychologist. How is that person going to tell you what's wrong with you? The, there was some research done about people just coming out of school being better therapists than the ones who've been doing it for 20 years. <laughs> they don't know shit, so they don't know what, what they might screw up. Well, yeah, I think there's some professions that benefit from age and wisdom. Some, not so much. Like, you don't want a 76-year-old Portland Trailblazer. Like you need a, you need a twenty-one-year-old, seven-foot-tall dude to to do that. Well, you know, there's a lot of variation in how good people are at doing therapy. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the other thing. How could you ever know? I I went to high school with this girl, and she is a psycho. And I'm not gonna say who she is or where she practices or any of that kind of stuff. So tell me what a psycho is. She has significant mental issues, significant. So you're, you're summarizing things. Tell me the symptoms. Well, I can't tell you because I don't want to give away who this person is. But this person has many issues. Okay, let's do it a different way. How do you feel in her presence? I don't communicate with her anymore. You don't feel safe? Uh, no, no. Because that's really the issue. You just track safety. Well, yeah, going back to what you said, it's about the safety. But the, the point that I'm trying to make is that she is a practicing psychologist. Oh, cool. She has patients that pay her who knows how much money for her advice. And I would not get a beer at Applebee's with her. <laughs> and there are people paying her money. That is... The, the challenge when you're finding someone to give you advice, yep. how do you have any, just because they have a degree doesn't mean that they know what they're doing. Well, you know, the, uh, I learned a long time ago that uh, people that I thought were shit as psych psychologists, as counselors, their patients come out happy. Why? Because they're using the, the, the psychologist as a prop in order to fix themselves. Hmm. And so a lot of really shitty people, they're useful. So you're <laughs> saying that they just, they go to see somebody so that they can tell other people in their lives, I figured it out. No, they, they're going to sit with you. You're going to reflect something back. They're going to go, oh, because that's what human beings do with each other. The nervous system develops first. You co-regulate, which means you work with somebody else, and then you auto-regulate. Mm -hmm. Co-regulation is I talk, you go, mm-hmm. You know, that's, that goes, oh, I'm okay. He went, mm-hmm. I can keep going. So we're, you know, you can take care of me. You can be a whack job. <laughs> You just, yeah, just scribble notes every once in a while and they think you're figuring something out. Yeah. I mean, it's not like you go into therapy knowing what the hell it is. I tell people when they sit with me, this, this is not therapy. <laughs> See, this is, this is why this is good. I probably couldn't have had this conversation with you 10 years ago. No. And I wouldn't have had it with you. Yeah. But now I don't give a fuck. Yeah. Well, that's the beauty of it. Well, it's disappointing because I think the majority of people need help and some seek it out and most do not. And the ones that do, sometimes they get help and um, it's beneficial for everyone to be of sound mind and mm -hmm. kind and compassionate and caring and be able to appreciate other humans because that's the that's the biggest problem is just like like I said earlier when you don't know what somebody's thinking or you don't know what their intentions are you create 
crazy shit in your mind that's probably not real. It's probably not accurate either. No. <laughs> We're all just running around with a bunch of <laughs> crazy shit in our heads that... Um, that's why I told you, if you want to not do that, shut the fuck up. Well, it's easy to say. It's well, it's a practice. Do. It's a practice. Mm -hmm. It's like a meditative practice. It's like a discipline. So what would you say to people who... What would you say to people who um, feel like they could use some help? Are they supposed to go to these Ooh. recommended psychiatrists? Are they supposed <clears throat> to seek out? So everybody could use some help. Mm -hmm. So we're, we can't actually exclude anyone. Um, if you're present when you talk to people, you're going to be helpful. There's just no chance that you won't be. There's nobody that can't be helped. There's nobody I could talk to that wouldn't make their life better. When we're done here, you're going to notice that there are shifts in your energy. You're going to mm -hmm. think twice about when your head is busy and you know you're stuck in a conflict, you're going to go, hmm, I wonder if I could shut the fuck up. Mm -hmm. But there's some people <clears throat> you can't help. I don't believe that. What about, what about people in deep, dark schizophrenia? It's just a thing. Have you worked with somebody like that? Sure. How do you even begin the conversation? They're not here. No, nah, they're here. Are they? Yeah. You just watch. And they're an adaptive organism. They're adapting. Well, they're alive, so they're adapting. There's, what? there's an interchange going on all the time. <clears throat> what, what, what do you think that is? What is... Mental illness. What is schizophrenia? <laughs> so, um, what a question. So, this, <sighs> if that was an experience, I would do it. If that was a pill you could take for six hours, I would 100% do it. I want to know what that's like because that shit is crazy. So the, the, the difficulty is the torment part of it. So your uh, system that decides what's real and not real is a mess. You got pictures and sounds and sensations going on. And you can't really tell what's real. And it torments you. It's the torment that's the hard part. You can get all of the schizophrenic experience by taking a hallucinogen, mm -hmm. psilocybin or LSD. Or, mm -hmm. And, you know, you'll, you'll do just fine with that because there won't be any torment. You may discover that you're a controlling asshole and you need to knock that off. <laughs> but that's a dangerous place to not, to not have your facilities, to, to be in a different – to be in a different – realm all the time that's terrifying and those people they don't they don't know that that's where they're at and if you could offer suicide or anything i mean they can't even make that decision that's like it's unreachable it's like um i don't know man it's the unknown and it's so I, w I just wonder if we're ever going to understand it. So I spent my first 10 years doing acute work in a hospital. So seeing people that are in, in acute states of craziness. You know, when you have somebody come in who's acutely psychotic, um, you know, you try to be as gentle as you can with them and use medications to help them calm down. But as they're calming down, they begin to look like people. You begin to see their humanity. If you're gentle with them, if you're respectful of them, you know, they, can, they can tell the difference, makes a difference to be loved, be cared about, to be heard. And that doesn't make any difference whether your world is crazy or not. I mean, we, we can do better than we actually do. So it's kind of like the, the study that they did with babies and uh, the removal from their parents, right? <clears throat> Where just the act of holding them and giving them physical touch creates 
uh, a sense of love and a sense of caring that the babies that they just stuck in the maternity ward by themselves didn't quite get. Yep. You're back to safety again. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I don't think that there's anybody you can't help feel safe. Now, maybe I wouldn't be able to do that, but I certainly go into it believing that I can and just open my heart, quiet my mind. I don't focus on limitations and if you're psychotic, you're psychotic, you know, we'll see what we can do. I'm curious. So of all the mental afflictions that you've dealt with, what what is the least the least rewarding or the least chance that you feel that you could be successful? Is there like narcissism, borderline personality disorder, uh, split personality? Or is there a certain affliction that you're just like, oh man, this is going to be, this nope. is going to be, none, none of I don't it. do that. No? Because I have to haul that around with me. Mm -hmm. I'm not doing that. But so some have got to take... be more challenging than others. Well, what's the challenge? All it is is my neurology has to figure out a better way to adapt. I'm so, going to get a benefit. So how do you communicate with the narcissist? How do you explain to them that the world does not revolve around them? Oh, I wouldn't do that. What would you, what, what would you do? <laughs> no. What would you do? Well, it, it depends on what they need. I mean, you know. They need to feel powerful. Well, maybe in the moment, you, you know, why are they seeing me? You know, why are they in my presence? You know, are they trying to hustle me? You know, <laughs> it's like, you know, it, it's like it's just a human being. They are not a diagnosis to me, not ever. Do you ever feel like you didn't succeed? <clears throat> well, I certainly feel like I didn't accomplish what I wanted to accomplish. You know, if I see somebody who's uh, tormented and after working with them, I, I can't reduce the torment enough so that they can feel grounded and stable. That's just awful. I hate that. But it's not mine. You know, they take what they can take. Yeah, but I'm sure you internalize it, right? You, you what said does you, that mean? Well, you said you were married for 48 years. Is that yes. right? <clears throat> Sorry, my throat is... needs more something. Um, you've been married for 48 years. Are there nights that you come home and your wife is just like... <clears throat> you go do something in the other room. Well, You're dealing with some stuff. So for the last, uh, since 1993, I, my office is in my house. So That's convenient. So it's, uh, we're back and forth throughout the day. There are no days where I'm coming home like that. So she, <laughs> you know. But it's still like, I don't know how you wouldn't. That's That's the pro and the con of what you do is that you get to, change people and help them and and they get to grow but also you have to like absorb that that garbage that they're releasing no nah, i don't you don't <laughs> no. where, do, where does it go fuck me you have a garbage can no nah, it goes through me it goes through you because huh. what's going to hold it in place I, i'd have to use a story to hold it in place otherwise it's just their life and it's precious to them it's important to them yeah but how did you teach yourself not to absorb that um, How do you not absorb anything that you interact with anybody? I, f I pick up on stuff. I'm picking up on you, picking up on my kid, picking up on my friend at work. Well, your body responds to it first. Okay. So I, I've learned, I've trained myself to love my body. I've gone from a shitty self-image to really having a lot of respect for who I am as a human being and, and having great compassion for me. That makes a difference when somebody gives you their shit. And you go, oh, wow, you know, I can love you with that shit. So when you started, did you not love yourself? No. No? <laughs> Fuck me. No. <laughs> so what did it take to figure that out? Oh, 30 years of bumping <laughs> around and being stupid. <laughs> And I, I started working like maybe 15 years ago with a self-awareness trainer, one of these guys that wakes you up. See, I find that fascinating. And no offense to you or anybody else that does it, but the fact that your therapist has a therapist. <laughs> it's kind of like when uh, I went through a, a divorce recently, uh, five years ago. And uh, 
we went to a marriage counselor and she had been through a divorce. And I was like, how the fuck are you going to give me advice? <laughs> you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> and then I thought about it and I was like, actually, she un understands it better than somebody who's still married. Yep. And so you're saying that having a therapist help you become a better Yeah, only this therapist. person isn't a therapist. He's okay. like a guy who started with Est, which is really radical uh, stuff to make you identify what's your delusion and what's not. What, what did you say? Started with S? Est. Est. It's Warner Earhart seminars. Okay. Back in the late 60s, early 70s. Okay. Stuff to wake you up. Okay. And so that was, you, you felt a dramatic change in your practice yeah. after being with, with that yeah, guy. Yeah. The first time I, I sat with this guy, it's like the second day into it and he's got me doing these exercises and I'll wake up. And I go, shit, I have been cruel to my wife hmm. the whole time we've been together. Hmm. And I didn't know I was doing it, but I woke up to it with a sense of compassion. Like I, I forgave myself at the moment I noticed it. And what did she say when you started acting differently? She was elated. Yeah. Did she think that you were shitty? Um. Or did she not realize? <laughs> no, she knew. <laughs> she knew. <laughs> well, and it's like, you know, uh, human beings are funny. They, they think they got what they deserved. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, you get used to whatever it is. It's not like I didn't love her. Yeah. It's just no. that I could just be a shithead. <laughs> well, I mean, there's, there's varying degrees of it, too. Uh, your idea of what that is is significantly different from yeah somebody else observing the relationship might have thought of as a really good relationship you know you know you live in there that's what's cool though is that <laughs> if th that to me is what this is it's you go am i doing it right am i am i treating my kids right am i treating my spouse right am i treating my my boss at work right am i doing this right or can I be better? And it sounds like you asked yourself that and then you made it better. And your wife was like, whoa, yeah. I didn't even know that it was bad. And now it's like way better. Hmm. So that's, to me, that is what it should be. But most people won't do that. Most people just like, yeah, well, hmm. keep cruising. Keep doing what I'm doing. I think if you show people that they can take a step and make it small enough, they'll take it. Hmm. It's the way that I do things. Hmm. Baby steps. Yeah. Brain wants to adapt, wants to do a better job of adaptation. Everything that we do as a you know, science um, is all about developing systems that make us more adaptable. Well, in that vein, do you think it's going to get better? Do you think we're on a path of enlightenment? Shut up, I know. So, so, given that I'm in charge of creating my own reality, in my world, I see the possibility. And I also don't see any particular reason not to notice that the, it looks like shit out there. Mm -hmm. Everybody trying to dominate everyone keeps you from being clear. If you're clear, you have a chance to be decent to each other. If you got a, if you, if you're sure that you're right, then you can't be loving. Hmm. And as long as we think being right is important, it's, we're pretty well fucked. You know, we got maybe a couple of decades to save the human race, and then if we don't do that, it'll just go extinct. Hmm. The world doesn't need us. I know. That's the the beautiful and depressing thing. It, I mean, you know, if really... we go extinct, we earned it. <laughs> it's like, fuck me. <laughs> That's why I just do what I do and I don't worry about stuff anymore. The dinosaurs were around for three, four, 500 million years, <laughs> a long time, significantly longer than humans. The fact that we made it this long is pretty crazy. And if we make it more than a couple hundred years from now, I would be very surprised. And so 
I think people need to stop thinking this is like eternity. This is going to end. This is not sustainable. So you should, I mean, that's not an excuse to be shitty and like throw garbage on the ground and ruin the earth. But like. So, so just, my, my thinking is, is that, um, are you familiar with the hundredth monkey phenomenon? Mm -hmm. This is uh, morphic resonance, Rupert Sheldrake's work. Um, if enough people change the way they believe about things, it moves in as an energetic force within the culture. And we've had a bunch of quantum leaps like that where culture has shifted. L look at racism. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, we generally hold that you shouldn't be selling someone into slavery. We still have trafficking, but we generally hold that every race deserves to be respected. Mm -hmm. That's a huge improvement. True. And it's like, are we good at it? Shit. But we're better at it. Mm -hmm. And that you can be optimistic about that we really had the capacity to make that change and we've moved in that direction. So, you know, what else can we do? Can we get so that we don't have to go to war, that we don't have to use force to solve problems? I'm going to hold yes. I'm, I know that it's possible, but it'll take a quantum leap. And my part of the leap is to have it happen in me first. I think we got too smart. Yes. I think we advanced. <laughs> <laughs> much quicker than we can handle well, he heads above penises so <laughs> your penis is smarter than your brain <laughs> there are some things that we have done that are unbelievable like we were just talking about the dinosaurs roamed the earth hundreds of millions of years and they just ate each other and drank water and nibbled on leaves forever. Pretty we healthy. Have, we have computers in our pockets yeah. and we send people to the moon and rovers to Mars. <laughs> it's insane. And it's, it's, it's unsustainable and it, it goes so fast. You can't stop it. Like so we, we don't know what's sustainable and what's not. Okay. I mean, we are first off human beings and if we learn to love each other, if we learn to be respectful, we learn to realize that you think this way and I think that way. So what? What the fuck? Mm -hmm. Then there's a chance. Then we'll see because the, you know, the mythology, the biblical mythology of the Tower of Babel is, is that God messed up all the languages and made everybody so different because when they worked together, they were just up to no good. I, I have a suspicion we need to reverse that myth. If this person or thing is real, why would you do that? Which, is he that bored? Which person are you talking about? God. <laughs> why is this thing doing this? Is is it the best ant farm ever? So, are, What is he doing? So are you having a discussion with me about whether God exists? What is this? Yeah, because I don't subscribe to that. And I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm saying I don't have proof for it. And I'm saying if that is a thing, which is totally possible, why? What is the point? <laughs> why create all these issues for regular people like you and me? <laughs> well, if that's your worldview, then you got a bitch with them. <laughs> well... You know, if, if I die and there's a heaven, he's going to be like, later, dude. <laughs> Maybe. You know, he may be really happy with what you've done with your life. Who knows? Um, Do you believe? So, I'm responsible for what I believe, which means that I make it up. That's all you can do, really. Yeah, you don't have any choice about that. Now, I can take, I was, I grew up as a, a fundamental Christian. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I have a degree in Greek and Hebrew, biblical languages, so I'm pretty good at that, understanding the Bible. And, and to me, it's a really lovely religion uh, for children. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the to believe in a God that creates the world in seven days and does miracles, I, this is just fun. And 
So you go, well, do you believe or not believe? Well, I have a sense that as a human being, I, that's really above my pay grade. I don't know whether the God exists or not. I don't have anything in my sensory system that would allow me to v verify that. So I simply hold the belief because I find that it's positive and entertaining for me. And it's something I grew up with. So it's part of my culture, mm -hmm. but I'm responsible for that. Mm -hmm. And it's not right for me to hold a belief that costs you something. That's the issue. If, if the people that believed what was written and what was practiced it would be a better place, but they don't. They they use it as an excuse to make themselves better than someone else who doesn't believe it. And I'm not, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about a, a group of people. If you practice the tenets that were in that book, you would not do the things you do. Well, I think if you talk to people, they'll tell you they do. Well, that's no matter, the problem. No, yeah, no matter what it is. And it's like, well, you're going to, you know, if you, you practice Christ's teachings, then love is the greatest teaching of all, that you love one another as I've loved you, which is, you know. And prostitution is okay. Well, it's not something that he spoke about. He hung out with them? Yeah. Some of his best if friends. If I sell my body 40 hours a week to where I work, why couldn't I? sell my sex organs why is that a thing <laughs> why are we so hung up on that because we like it <laughs> because it Look, is it's a great way to feel superior to somebody else that's what it is it's it's i have the answer and you do not and i'm going to impose rules upon you yeah and at, at the same time i'm going to allow this black market to thrive where they're going to sell your body and you're not going to profit from it yeah it's a, it's a dark, dark world. <laughs> I didn't want to end it there, but we're kind of at the spot. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> uh, so I appreciate you coming down here. That was awesome. It did not go where I thought it would, just like it never does, <laughs> but it was good. So thank you very much. All right. <laughs>